immense pleasure to introduce the ingenious, multifaceted personality and an eminent speaker. Mr. Venkat Raman is a senior advocate in the Supreme Court. He is well known for his unparalleled argumentation and his clarity of thought and comprehension. He has been guided and mentored by his senior, Sri C. Natarajan, under whom he has practiced for more than a decade. He has, in his illustrious career, worked with tax, tax tribunals, settlement commissions, authority for advance rulings, and the central appellate mechanism. Mr. Venkatraman has also appeared many a time on matters dealing with international taxation, transfer pricing, VAT, etc. His judgments have often won him inter intellectual praise and ardent admirers many of whom are youngsters he has inspired through his lectures. With the blessings of his Guru, His Holiness Sri Sri Bharati Tirtha Mahaswamihal of Sri Sharada Peter, he runs a Veda Patashala in Melamangalam near Theni and he has also constructed a temple in Kodi Mangalam. It is this deep-rooted, unflinching faith in the Divine that has enabled him to imbibe all the essential values that befit a conscientious lawyer. It is indeed our honor that you are in our midst this afternoon to channelize our thoughts and sharpen our skills in our role as molders of tomorrow. We welcome you, sir. Vivekinam Mahaprakyam Dairodhara Kshamanidim Sada Inavu Purvam Tam Vidhya Thetta Guru Vajay Agyanam Jannavi Thettam Vidhya Thettam Vivekinam Sarvesham Shukatam Thettam Karati Thettam Arshi Vidhya Vinaya Sampanam Vitaragam Vivekinam Vande Vedanta Tattukyam Vidushekara Bharati Entire presentations at the lotus feet of my spiritual guru also take the good wishes of my professional guru and consider this as one of the finest moments because I happen to be so fortunate to be in the midst of the teaching community. Namaste to each one of you. Swami Vivekananda quotes, this life is short. The varieties of the world are transient, but they alone live who live for others. The rest more dead than alive. I offer my humble prostrations and namaskarams to here, the future builders of the society. Namaskar. Madam OGP, Sheila Rajendar. Mr. Rajinder and my friends. <coughs> Changing times, that's the catch word. What prompted me first to think about such a topic? When they introduced me, could see the last clipping, would have seen the Patashala students in the presence of our spiritual guru. About 60 of them, every year, they, about 10 go out and the 10 come in. About 60 to 65 children read every year. 315 days in a year, they are away from their family. Some of them come from traditional families which has been in this area of work. But most of the children come from broken families, drunken father, mother cooking somewhere, a heart patient, not able to make, even, make up even a meal. It's these children who come there. So for 315 days, they are away from their parents. What happens to their emotional life is the question. So, Three of my cousins who handle the school along with their spouses, they 
do the dual role of administration and being the parents for these children for 315 days. Otherwise, the children for next to 10 years, as it comes here, seven to 10 years, cannot and will not be able to spend more than 20 to 25 days or 30 days in a year with their parents. We have been watching their lifestyle over a period of 10 years. And when you superscope it in, in a larger canvas, this is not for broken families of Patashala students alone. This now looks to be the order of the day. For the simple reason, both parents going to job is now a mat not, no longer a matter of choice, but a matter of compulsion for ever so many reasons. So both of them leave their homes early and return late. And we all talk about quality time, quantity time, all these sermons, discourses, more in the nature of talking. The child wants attention which he's not able to give. For, and after all, we do this all. Why do we go out together? Because it, we think it benefits the child. But putting all the arithmetics in its place, the child possibly is not getting what is due to it, which all of us have got from our parents when we were children. There is no point in discussing the pros and cons. It it will it'll take us nowhere. Whether to do it or not is not the question today, because there is a compulsion. Now, it by default, these children fall into the lap of their teacher in the school for 12 to 15 years. If you start counting from the pre-KG, arithmetically it should be some 13 to 15 years, whatever is the case. So 15 long years, the child spends the most active part of the day in the school and with its teachers. This is a matter of fact. Now, what do you therefore have to do for the child is the question. Are you under an obligation to act as mothers or fathers? Is it your duty to do it? Why should you do it? Well, I'm here to work, do my work according to my rules of the game. Why not I play only the tunes? These are the puzzling questions which keep cropping up again and again somebody has to take the responsibility of this young plant. They say, any human being who is assured of three types of love and kindness evolves into a very good human being. The kindness, the grace, the blessings, and the love of one spiritual guru. That's the supreme. When somebody sang about guru and being in the shadow of a guru, it's a lifetime experience. It's the highest. For which neither the parent nor the school, the parent can possibly, if they are in that lineage, induct the child also into that and give them the chance. School may have to, school or the teachers in the school may not have a direct role, unless otherwise you are able to influence the child in this philosophy. Now the second comes the mother's love. Next, immediate to guru's love. Why? Because it is selfless. A mother always thinks first of her family, her children, and thinks about her last and many a times don't think at all. So mother's love is next guru's love. And the third is the teacher's love. The kindness and love shown by a teacher to 
her students or his students. Imagine you roll back yourself 30, 40 years back as you have been in your, indefinitely you would have been in some school. Now think for a minute, who occurs to your mind as a teacher? The teacher who has seen you the most. The teacher who considered you special. The teacher who, in spite of scolding you, was ready to hug you immediately. The teacher who was ready to take a portion of your lunch along with you. Ready to winkle. Ready to have an eye contact with you. Re refrain from inflicting any injury to the child. There are days where, well, I remember some teachers on whose lap I have slept when I got fever because I was one student who was traveling 15 kilometers away. I was in a far off, far off village to travel to a school, English school. So 15 kilometers every day up and down. So 40, 35 years back, what sort of a transport you would have got? So these things cluster our minds immediately. So the child, when it walks out of the school, and chances to meet you after several decades will not try to recollect what you taught in your science or a chemistry syllabus. It will be able to recall immediately, this is what you did it to me, teacher. And I can't forget this in my I have spoken at least in 100 places about you. So what you leave in the mind of the child is not the textbooks. It's something else. What is that? So, <clears throat> these three loves cannot be compromised. And what is in your hand today is your teacher's kindness and love. That is very much within your hold. Now you are under an obligation also to play the dual role of a mother or a father to the child. Because it spends its active hours only with you. Now, why do we say this? If, you, if we comprehend what our minds look like, mind is an intangible, but it does have certain parts. It's made up of certain parts. It basically has four chambers. Broadly speaking, I'm not taking the philosophical parts today. I'll broadly refer those parts and then get, into the, get back to the subject as to what we are supposed to do. It has four broad chambers called the manas, the feeling portion of the mind. The chittam, the memory portion of the mind. The buddhi or the intellect, intelligent portion of the mind and the ahankara, the ego, which identifies itself, whatever it is doing. Manas and chittam, they go together, because they are pair of friends. One is feeling, another is memory. It can recall, did you not do this to me? That day, you recall, 15 years back, what happened to you? Because that's flowing from the chittam. Intellect and ego, they go together, broadly. Now, I want all of you to imagine for a minute a physical child, a child of your choice. Imagine the child as a small child and technically cut it into two. Imagine that the child's mind and chittam is not emotionally strengthened or supported. It's not growing well. Imagine that side of the child remaining only as a child. And the intellect and ego keeps boosting minute by minute through our educational system. After 12 years, 
Imagine that child. A very small, tiny right hand. A very small, tiny right side face. Small eyes. Somewhere here. And a grown up boy or girl. Strengthened hands, strengthened legs on the left side. Now imagine, how do you connect this end of the mouth to that end? How do you connect this pair of this part of the eye to that pair? What sort of a face will that child look like? Just imagine. It will be worse than a ghost. Inconceivable. This is what is happening to most of our children. You are not to be blamed. Parents are, who, are to, who is to be blamed? Let's not get into the blame game. It makes no sense. Somebody has to be blamed in the system. But the real challenge is we are now in the era called the information age. And what does it do? On a click of a button, you are able to access any information in this, that is available in this world. So access to information stimulates your intellect. In fact, overstimulates your intellect. Excessive information and overstimulation. This is the order of the day and therefore there is a compulsion to ensure we keep m who gives the most uh, uh, I mean, uh, the facilities for a, a child to access the best information possible is now the race. So the child, one side of the child is being heavily loaded. It is not able to bear that weight. That's the kind of information we are, we are, they are able to access today. This is one, one, so this is this growth that is happening. Whereas its emotional side continues to drain and ooze out. Somebody sent one WhatsApp message a few days back. A child was struggling here and there to collect $35. Whoever comes, somebody gives money, she will keep it uh, safely. She managed to collect $35 in over a period of 18 months. And it goes to his father. I heard 18 months back you telling somebody that my salary per day is $35. Here is my $35. Why don't you be with me for a day? So, this is the need for a child. Now, some time back, as we were flying from here to Delhi, a young contingent was traveling with me, some off-site meeting in Gurgaon. So, young boys, young girls, all working together, they were freaking out in the flight. So, the lady who was sitting next to my seat was possibly pioneering that joy. With the flight just touched the base and started to move towards the uh, parking bay. She opened her phone and called her mother. Has she got up on time? Have you bathed her? Did you feed her? Has the school bus come? Has she boarded the bus carefully? Array of questions, one after, even without receiving the answer, the question gets pumped. She's not waiting for an answer from her mother. And the most interesting part was, I have been telling you repeatedly, two identical Tiffin box, one red in color, one blue in color. Daughter loves blue, husband loves red, husband doesn't love blue, I hope you have not packed the Tiffin in the blue box. She's so very particular because he won't eat. If you send the, if you send any meal in a blue box, he won't even open it, ma. Then I could hear that. Come on, how many times you will be saying this to me? 
So this is how they try to balance their life. They need to be in the off-site, offshore meeting for three days on a Friday afternoon to say Sunday evening and keep tracing it down as to how family is because you have the technology to follow it up. So this is the kind of quality time they are trying to afford to their children. Full time, the children is only with you. So what happens if the growth is so lopsided? You don't give them the right emotional connect and you keep pumping them excessive intellectual outputs to make them brilliant, make them number one. Now in this, we are in an era where you have only one slot, number one slot. If eight teams play, all the eight should come for number one. If somebody comes four or five, it's a useless team. Somebody comes eight, he's unfit to play. That's, that's the gradation world is now parked it. So, none of us can change it. Please, this lecture is not an attempt to change all this. I am nobody. And when, when the world moves in a particular direction, don't swim against the current. It is foolish. So, this attempt is not to change any of these systems. None of us can change. It's, it's so fixed. And it overruns us. So, don't try to swim against the current. That's not the suggestion. But within the limited window, what we can still do, that's the point I want to drive home today. Nothing else. Now, in this lopsided growth, what is the ultimate output we achieve on a child? Swami Ranganatha Ananda of the Ramakrishna order has contributed four volumes. He has written it in several small parts, compiled into four volumes, Eternal Values of Changing Times. It's a beautiful collection. It's about 3,000, 4,000 pages. But each one is one and a half page, each article. So easy to read. Now, he brings out a beautiful distinction between individuality and personality. He says, a child minus right emotions becomes an extremely aggressive and assertive child and will start fighting for its rights alone as an individual. It can never fit into the scheme of a coalition. It will keep fighting for its right. Anything it wants, it, it wants attention, it wants resources, it wants uh, to be first it will keep on drawing attention. So individuality allows you to keep fighting for your rights. You will never know what is duties, what is responsibilities, what is your obligations. It's a right-based uh, growth. On the contrary, he says, if you evolve a child as a personality, and he says, what is the difference between individuality and personality? Individuality is sheer intelligence, smartness, cleverness, crookedness, etc., etc. You can add any ad adjectives to it. Whereas personality is a human being with a character and conduct. Character building. One who has a character in him or her becomes and evolves into a personality. And this is the basic distinction. Now, in our days, less homework, less stress. We were under stories. I still remember one of my teachers, she will somehow manage sometime to tell at least twice a week some English film that got released in those days. Those f we, it won't be even accessible for us to go near the theater. So she will come and narrate about, that, about what happened, how motor cars are prepared, how one motor car can clash with. All we let only dream in our, imagine in our minds. We could not have gone and seen it in the screens. So that teacher still remains in our hearts. So we, they managed within the syllabus all this. Could, they could do it. You should have also been a recipient of such uh, 
beautiful moments. So, this is the evolution. Character building. Building a person as a character. And he concludes, a person who is built with a good character understands rights. In fact, somebody was, uh, as they introduced, they were defining ethics. I have not heard a definition of ethics uh, uh, so short but pregnant with meaning. Absolutely remarkable uh, way to say. Doing right and understanding what it. Beautiful distinction, I would say. That is precisely what is happening between an individuality and a personality. A personality is one who evolves as a man or a woman with character. Now, he therefore says, what should a teacher do? It's an article about a teacher. And it's all written in 1950s, 60s, where we were in the infant stage as a democracy. So more directed toward nation building. So, he says, a teacher has three obligations. The first, we say 15 years, you, you are all experts, you know how to divide this 15 into three parts. Fill the first portion with nice emotional feelings. The first segment of a child, you don't have to change your syllabus, you don't have to give extra marks, no extra classes, no tests, nothing. Just behave with the child. Spend, spend your way with the child that way. As you would do with your... No parents take uh, syllabus. They don't have a, draw, a drawing board or a syllabus to teach what love is. They love the child and the child understands it. Child can pick it up. So that's why I assured you, I'm, I'm not here to comment on the system or change the system. Not at all. Not at all. What is within your reach, I'm trying to suggest. So, the first leg of a child's life should be filled with emotions, nice emotions, because it is this which it carries till the last. Initial years of good balanced emotions makes a child a wonderful child. The second segment in this three parts, fill it with its, its abilities and individuality, encourage it. Keep encouraging, you can do it. You find out, see, I mean, you're all, I'm nobody to suggest. If you can find out even one single aspect in a child, which is otherwise nine minus, keep encouraging and supporting chi that child with that one plus. It will slowly start coming up from one, from one plus to ten plus. It may come, it may not come. That's not, but try. So the second leg is ensuring that it has to come up in life as a responsible individual. And the last phase of the school life, ensure it has a sound character. The child has a sound character. So that it builds a good family, it becomes a part of a responsible society and in the process it strengthens and builds a strong nation. Please connect the child with the nation whenever you can. Connect them with three things. Family, society and the nation. So the third phase of the child should have these features. And he puts it in his own style. The emotional part, he calls it as partly physical, which is all enough advertisements are there to say what you should eat as a child. Most of which is taken also by the parents because it's tasty. So now the first portion is the physical and emotional energy. He says it is energy which you are imparting into the child, not anything. It is real energy. And it's like that energy, once it is into the child, it's there forever. So the first part is emotional energy. 
The second part, he calls it as the intellectual energy. And the third part, he says, which is vital, it is character energy. Now, if a child has only one energy, individual energy, it's bound to end up ultimately into a brat. That's what he concludes. Because an individual energy will lose all its significance without the twin support of emotional energy and character energy. Now, all right, this is very nice to hear technically and conceptually. I could see that reaction running into your minds. Come on, tell me, how can we do it? We are ready to listen. That's the point. Now, can we discuss and see? I'm ready to take some questions also post this session, if you can permit me. I'm, I'm, because learning is a two-way process. So I've come here to learn because you're all teachers. And uh, you should feel so happy. That's the first education which we should impart to ourselves. Now, what should I do? I'm, in case you are in agreement with this philosophy. If there is no agreement, well, I have to now learn from you. If you have a better one, please do tell me. I will use it in the next session. Because learning is a progressive uh, uh, therapy. But one request I do want to make. Before coming, uh, preparing, or in the course of the preparation, before the final touches were given, at the chance, because I have good friends who are teachers, school teachers, very responsible school teachers in various schools in the city. So spent some time talking to each of them to find out what is possible and what is not possible. And uh, I, I had tested it in-house before coming and speaking to you, I should say. That's, that's the whole idea. So that it doesn't look completely something... Uh, it's some Western music when uh, in a music uh, season of uh, Carnatic uh, listeners. That should not happen. So, when, when you want to give these three energies to a child, what the next 20 minutes, what I intend to do is, what should you possess as attributes? That's the point. In case you have these attributes yourself, all of you are teachers and you must be having it by default. And if you understand and comprehend these attributes and put it into effective views, this may possibly impact the child better. That's the, that's, it, it's a suggestion, it's a perspective or a viewpoint. You can take it that way. Now, what should be your frame of mind? We'll start from there. We have heard this term, karma yoga, I think a million times in our life and a million interpretations also. All of us know one, one formula, do your actions and don't wait for the reward. It's something so prosaic that's got into our mind that we, we, we hate to hear that. We know all that. A child will say that, a mother will say that, a teacher will say that, and anybody will say that. Even though it's one of the finest philosophy, again, overstimulated. But this is very relevant for today, for a teacher from a different perspective. That's why I'm bringing it here. See, you do something and you don't expect a reward. It's, one, it's a challenge by itself. Because why I say it's a challenge by itself? You know by putting this action there is going to be a reward then it's very difficult to refrain from thinking about that reward. Just as a human psychology. If you know, if you do this, this is the recognition you will get. Will you not be motivated to think about that recognition? It's simple. So, the philosophy that don't wait for the rewards, it requires a tapas. That is one aspect. But for a teacher, the story is very different and therefore it is achievable. For a teacher, from day one she has assumed this responsibility till she retires. And according to me, a teacher never retires. She can't, because she's a teacher, or he's a teacher. 
So there's no retirement. A teacher in a teacher's life, in a teacher's profile, you can only put efforts because rewards are never going to come to you. This is, this is the whole essence of teaching. It is a life of that nature. How do you say that or why do I say that? It's the story of a gardener. See, when you understand this, your stress goes out of you and you will become a super teacher if you believe in this philosophy. It's not, you can contest it, I'm ready to take questions, but unless you accept this in your mind, why I say the rewards are never going to come to you, the child is not going to come and offer its monthly salary a portion of it to you because you taught me. It's not going to do that. No student in your life will do that. He will offer you a good celebration, he will come for the 30th year, do all that alumni, all that will happen. But will any student say, the moment I start earning, I will remember all my teachers, I will cut my salary in different 30 parts and start giving every month. Nobody will do it. So rewards will never reach the institution, will never reach the teacher. So you are in a better position. That's the point I'm trying to dive. It's not that you know rewards will come and you should not expect. That is difficult. You can now imagine rewards are not going to come to you. Be clear about that. And how do you still do the job efficiently? See, it's the story of a gardener. The owner of the house will go to the nursery, pick the best roses, put it in the car, come and plant it. Her job is over. Then the gardener takes over it. He has to nurture the plant, protect the plant, and ensure day in and day out, it is he who serves the plant. And the moment the first rose sprouts, the lady will come out of the house, pick it up, put it on her head and get into the car and walk away. The gardener has no right over the roses. Teaching job is one such. Accept it. Accept it happily. Don't have to crib. Please don't crib. I request you all. Because otherwise you would not have been teachers this long if you have, if you have decided to crib. When you understand and accept it, there is a chance for you to work better. That's the only point I'm trying to... It's not that you do not know this. You very well experience it every year. At the end of the examination is over as the child says, goodbye teacher. The child which whom have seen for 12, 13 years together. Emotional parting is easy for the child, difficult for the teacher, year after year. So, this happens. So, you are in an area where rewards are not going to come to you. Once this is in your mind, it enables you to take the second step. The second step is, all of us, there are two ways of looking. Look here, I'm a teacher. All these students are my children, and it's my responsibility to shape them. So it starts from you. That's one way to think of your profile. But Swami Vivekananda says, charity, I say charity here because you are actually doing charity. Vidya Dhanam. There is a profile, there is a fees, all that is different. The personal transmission of knowledge is identified as Vidya Dhanam. And it is the only Dhanam which carries one unique feature. Only Dhanam. Any other charity or Dhanam, when you give from one to the other, one takes it and one gives it. So there is a transfer from the giver to the taker. And therefore, to that extent, the giver loses control over the gift. Including Kanyadana. More importantly, when you get your daughter married, you will know what it is. <laughs> 
So I say this with a lot of happiness, but it's, it's a fact. It's, a, it's once gifted, you have no proprietor right over the gift. It's somebody's property now. Somebody, when I say, don't say property, women is not a property, don't say, no, no, when I say, yeah, some, when I say, I'm a lawyer, so I use my, my for heaven's sake, do not even, do not even think, I apologize for having used the word that way. I apologize. Never me meant it that way. So, so this is this is one way. In the case of Vidya Dhanam, it remains intact with the teacher in spite of transmission of that knowledge. Continues to retain it with him or with her. That's the beauty of Vidya Dhanam. Now, what they say in charity. There are two ways, because in charity, one is a giver, another is a taker. So, you can feel, I am a giver, and there is somebody to take. That's one way of looking at it. Swami Vivekananda says, then, the purpose of charity is lost. It will not give the desired effect to the taker. If you're going to say, it is me who is giving that, it's going to first harm you, to some extent, and also harm the taker because that is not how you can gift when you choose to gift. There is a principle uh, involved in even gifting. So Swami Vivekananda says, in any charity, when somebody is going to take from you, think for a minute, you are the most fortunate person because God has sent somebody to whom you have the capability of giving something, which is a rarity. How many can give? World is a place to take and plunder. World is a place to only exploit. That's the understanding um, world is showing to us. World results are showing to us. Whereas in the case, feel so proud. That's the pride. When I say pride, it is not arrogance. Never. Feel confident. Feel nice that as a teacher, God, if you believe in God, or nature, if you believe in nature, or whatever you believe, has given me these beautiful ears because it sends me a bundle of children year after year to take energy from me. All this is all in Swami Vivekananda's words. If you Change your mind in this way. That's why I said no extra syllabus, no extra tests, no extra classes. No. How you change your value systems? It's all there already in you. You're all trained teachers. Nobody needs to train you. All is this with you. Just align it in a particular way so that you look like a beautiful jewelry in the eyes of a child who reads under you. You should just, that you should illuminate to a child. Swami Vivekananda says, you can illuminate. Every teacher can illuminate. How? That's the process. The first rule is, take it into your mind, you are a gardener. You can only nurture a plant. You have no rights over the roses. Be clear. The second law is, you are in a position to give charity, not take. The fewest in the world can give charity. The fewest. Only the rarest are picked for a charity job. It's a blessing to be in a position to give. So, never ever think that here are children who are coming to read to me. Well, it's I'm supposed to do. Don't do it. Never do that. Instead, feel that what, so we will use it as you are the timely resource and the timely connect to a child who is going to stay with you for more than 10 to 12 years or 15 years of, your, of his or her active time. So, this is the second requirement which he mandates and gives a beautiful story in that volume. What, what do you mean by charity? Now, parents, along with their son and daughter-in-law, four of them live in a hut. 
struggling and starving. And the man somehow manages to bring some barley one day. And they prepare a small meal after a long time to eat. Suddenly, a guest comes into the house. Atiti Devo Baba is our tradition. So the, the father offers one-fourth of the meal to the man. He says, I'm still hungry. The mother parts her one-fourth to the man. He consumes it and says, I'm still hungry. The son parts his one-fourth. And finally, the daughter-in-law parts her one-fourth. The man says, my hunger is satiated. Bless you and goes off. That night, all the four die out of starvation. Now, as he brought the barley powder into the house, a few drops of it spilled over the floor. A mongoose rolled over it. It's a story from Mahabharata. A mongoose rolled over it. Half of, half side, one half side of the mongoose became gold. And it was anxious to convert the other side of it also to gold. So it goes to the Rajasuga Yagam of Yudhishthira. One of the greatest Egyas portrayed in any in our uh, epics. The kind of wealth that was distributed as charity. It said, it then goes and complains. I kept on rolling all over. My, this sec my second half has still not converted into gold. The Pandava say, why are you saying so? Look at the type of uh, charities we have done all these years, all these days during, to complete this. Is it nothing doing. Your, whatever you are given doesn't match with what these four people gave in spite of the fact that they are going to die. This is charity. And I am yet to see, the mongoose says, I am yet to come across a charity of this order. Otherwise, my other half would have turned into gold. You are all placed in that position. You should, you should conceive this in your mind clearly. Then start teaching them. You will teach from enormous strength. Instead of thinking, I am parting, God has gifted these children for me to enable to do something to these children's life. Have that in the back of your mind. Now, you go to the third stage. Once you decide to have conceived this as an opportunity to offer charity, you can do it in two ways. You can do it in a selfless way or you can do it as a sacrifice. That's the third stage a teacher is required to take in her mission, in her life as a teacher. A teacher is meant to sacrifice. You have taken that role. You have to live to that role. You can't say, why should I? You can't afford to say that. So, the third important feature, step you need to take in your life is sacrifice. What is that you can sacrifice? That's the point. You can sacrifice your invaluable time because mothers are not ready to give it. Fathers are not ready to give it. Society is not ready to give it. Nobody is there to attend the child emotionally. And it's caught with you by default. Only with you. It doesn't have a choice. It has its... See, what's any friends? How can friends... It's like a blind... Uh, six blind men leading... Uh, trying to define an... If you say that the child will grow because of friends, it will back, backfire. It still needs a guide. It still needs nurturing. So, understand this criticality in your life. Then you will believe, you will love to sacrifice. Because don't, you, don't, you will not even feel that you are doing it. It is so nice to sacrifice. If you start sacrificing. It's like propel, the initial, to propel them initially is difficult. To start the engine is difficult in any, any technology. Once the engine starts functioning, then it takes, it gains its own momentum. So, the third ingredient which you as a teacher should possess is 
the mind to sacrifice. See 50 children every day, how many will get it? So treat them as young roses, young rose plants. Conceive them. Each one, treat them. One could be a banyan. One could be a, a, a great. Imagine whatever you want to imagine. If you do that to a plant, does it not grow? Do that to the child. Emotional connect. I mean, not your syllabus. I'm nobody to suggest how you should teach. Please, not at all. That's not the attempt. Now, if you do these three things. Two major hurdles or challenges which you keep confronting frequently in your life as a teacher will vanish, is what is assured. One is, slowly, the element of ego will go out. See, ego is a very huge area. When I say ego, I'm limiting it to a particular circumstances. When I consulted with various teachers, this is the frank view they expressed. I'd, for heaven's sake, it is not pointing out anything against the teaching community or the teachers. This is something which the teachers speak to me when I, when I was discussing this topic. What should go out or the negatives that should go out, they pointed out two or three simple things. We as teachers, by virtue of doing the same job for so many years, somehow unconsciously inflict injury, emotional injuries on children. That's one admission teachers in private, when I discussed this, shared it. How far it is right or wrong, it's up to you to decide. I'm not thrusting it on you. If you do it as a charity, if you know that your resource of time is being parted, you have been used as a vehicle to part your time to your valuable, in bringing up a child into a great uh, human being, then will you try to hurt a plant which is coming up? We don't conceive it that way and therefore we readily injure a child. Getting angry moments, even mother gets it. And they get, a, and get along after that immediately. A teacher should also do that to the child. Never register impressions because the child will register it. Whether you register it or not, the child will register it. So injury is one, one aspect. And as a process, the older you grow, you slowly become an angry teacher. That's what teachers of a lot of experience, when I talk with them, we somehow become angry and we become, we, we become, we, we get irritated very easily. It's a natural, I'm, I'm sharing all this, these are teachers' view, not my view. After talking to teachers, I may be wrong. This is all subjective. These are perspectives I'm putting across. So, you don't become angry. How? Unless you have it. Go to the first rule. Can you conceive somebody has come to you? Can you, can you, show, you can show anger to your husband and husband can show anger to your wife. Will you show it to your guest? Even if you don't like him or her. You don't. So, you don't show it to, in, in, other than your setup, you don't show it normally if somebody is weak. It's easy to trample upon him or her. Should we do it or not? And the teachers say, they, see, they, nobody does it consciously. It's not with a vengeance to injure, no. By nature of our work, we start doing it. That's exactly what teachers say. We, over a period of time, these two things grip us. We become angry and we, we start inflicting injury. And what is its impact? The child already doesn't get any emotion. This is the conclusion they make. The, the, all these texts conclude this very important aspect. The child is climbing up intellectually into a brilliant child, lop one side, one half. And it already has no emotional package of good, nice feelings. It registers irritation. It registers injury. It registers angry moments. And an individual, a right specialist, one who keeps asserting you see, they will get anger momentarily. Anger, jealousy, hatred kills a human being. 
you don't need you don't need anything else to kill a person self killing it's a slow self suicide these three negative qualities and you must understand you are involuntarily preparing the child into this trap because the child can't rebound can a, can a child afford to shout back at the teacher i think we have not still reached reach that age i am disconnected i just putting a question narakaram jurda adilla sorry okay okay fine we are safe so i am right in my approach so i am just putting it so so it registers these three it it registers these emotions which translate into these three qualities in a child over a period of time and it becomes irresistible thereafter so therefore you don't whether you give good emotions or not is one aspect at least let's not impart negative emotions into a child so these are the three basic qualities which you should possess now comes the reward after all you, you we are supposed to expect no reward you just told us some time back no reward nothing is going to come and you are now talking about reward yes swami vivekananda says rewards has to reach you for your work it's not the reward which a parent gives or a student gives it's a reward nature or god whomever so you believe gives you and what is the reward you will get if you if you as a teacher do these three things in your life of teaching you will you are going to get assured results in the following six areas five or six areas it says your mind at the very outset by inculcating these three habits the job slowly becomes a duty and the duty slowly becomes a service so your mind slowly turns into a mind ready to serve because it's like a gardener loving his own plant these children are with you for 12 years so we have to take care of the child so the mind to serve comes if you are ready to renegotiate these three qualities into your dna mind to serve and this is the interesting catch if you get into the mode of mind to serve they all conclude your mind actually turns into a magnet that's the strength a teacher will gain see have we not seen students saying this teacher is exceptionally different from the rest why why should one teacher draw herself as a magnet from the rest go and explore somewhere is she doing it as a service in her heart from a heart so mind turns into a magnet and once mind becomes a magnet you start illuminating your you will radiate you will radiate contentment you will radiate peace you will radiate joy the place where you are will radiate and when all teachers put together then this this will radiate much better than any temple it's in your hands very much in your hands you can radiate you can illuminate now what do you mean by radiate or illuminate one story again from mahabharata swami swami vivekananda quotes it with reference to this context a person goes into tapas in the middle of a forest a sanyasi and acquires extraordinary power supernatural powers because he was in constant tapas and just sights a crane and burns it just at one sight the crane burns so he decides well see i could just burn a crane look to be a superman walks into the village for food knocks at the door of a lady and said the lady says please wait i'll come 
and the man and this and uh, this person shouts back you're making me wait don't you know i'm come here for food how dare you make me wait and he hears a noise uh, hears a voice from the from inside the house gentlemen don't think i am a crane like i am a woman you can't burn me so he stunned how does this lady know of the incident that happened in the forest so when she comes out and offers the bikshai to the person he says how did you know this then she says please walk a few meters away and go to the next village you will find a butcher by name vyadar go and talk to him he will tell you about it butcher i should go and meet a butcher please go and meet him so he walks and with trepidation stands opposite to his shop man cutting the meat and after he has done his job he goes and takes care of his parents keeps waiting and he finally comes out i think you have been waiting for me for too long what can i do for you in fact it's the other way he 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 is becoming slowly impatient and he he says then after finishing all his responsibilities he meets this person and says did that lady send you to me he is again stunned astonished no mobile phone at in mahabharata period huh? no call drop no clash calls no number portability nothing how did this man know that lady has sent him and uh, there is a geeta in called vyada geeta this butcher imparts knowledge to the person nothing is impure nothing is ugly do what god gives you as a service then you will get the same strength simple so illumination is this something which others normally don't possess this is the third and what are the inner benefits you will become slowly calm and steady and what will be your mind state of mind you do it for a few years then mind will dictate in you the most noble thing is to serve you will start teaching 24 by 7 as a service you won't be a school teacher confined to a classroom you will be a 24 by 7 365 day teacher whichever child comes across it will start to learn from you because you are in the mode or mission of service you are not expecting anything from anybody it is such a birth god has gifted to each one of you should we miss it or use it and imagine should we not build a stronger india an india where children grow growing up grooming up as individuals or not just individuals but personalities there is an element of if you do all this to a child and it carries the impression with it will it not in turn distribute it is a question of distribution energy all of us know in your it once it transmits it's capable of being used by everybody in different ways so this is exactly what your role is as a teacher thank you shila again for giving this in fact uh, musicians prefer december for kacheri <laughs> i prefer december every year to speak one session in psbb because if if i if i can't speak to you then who else to that's where i keep you in my hearts because this is one institution which is ready to experiment so this is my passionate request and uh, let me not conclude just with a monologue talk i want to take a few questions so that we if there is anything to be fixed let us try to fix it together so that it benefits more number of teachers and i have one more request 
this will be uploaded and in case you are happy about this please do share it with as many teachers and as many institutions if you find it worthwhile that choice is per per perfectly yours so that let's try to reach the whole singular idea is to evolve a better india with better community our children should not hate there's no point in it we should get this out of the society and let's work towards this goal to collectively and together with a safe sense of uh, uh, dedication and with a mind to serve it was wonderful for me these moments are golden moments in my life i'm looking forward to taking questions please No questions? Oh. I, mean, I think we need to have the clarity. Uh, is, it, is it going to be uploaded on YouTube? Yes. Or? If, if we will upload it both in YouTube and Facebook. And I will send the link uh, okay. to the school. Okay. And okay. I think... We can share it. You can share it if you want. That's, that's an assurance. Uh, we want to do it. We want to reach it. In fact, uh, my school, my correspondent has asked for it. I read in TVS in Madurai. So, she has asked for it and uh, I want to show it to my teachers first <laughs> at any cost. <laughs> yes. Uh, please use the mic so that people can hear your question. You were talking about the emotional connect. See, even when we are listening to you, we are sort of fairly familiar with the Ramayana, Mahabharata and those anecdotes sort of, you know, we are able to relate to you better. But with the present generation, even if I have to, you were talking about a teacher who narrated so well about an English movie, but it's going to be the other way around now. I don't watch Hindi English movies and the kind of books they read, I don't read. So how do I establish an emotional connect if I'm going to talk about uh, Nagesh comedy, they are going to give some other example. So I am becoming obsolete. Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah. I think it's a, it's a practical problem. It's a, I think question is clear to all of you. She is talking of uh, heritage and modern age. To put it precisely, the disconnect between heritage and modern age. See, at, on a trial and error basis, this is what I have found in my personal experience as a teacher. Even though I, my profession is law, I love to speak and therefore I've been doing it for a long time. Now, earlier we were in a society where respect was taken for granted. Therefore, there was a setup to follow, hierarchy was followed, father to child and between friends, how all that. Now, father is also a friend and worse than a friend. Now. In, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a canvas sense. We take it as a reality. It's not a comment or any negativity to attach to it. This is the reality. When we see the difference between understanding uh, religious thought and philosophizing it, once you enter into the canvas of philosophy, there is no condemnation at all. You don't have to condemn. That's exactly what philosophy helps you to understand. So this is the reality. How do we connect? Unless we connect with what that child likes, that child is not going to hoop with us. This was the technique my teacher applied 40 years back. She thought these guys cannot see English movies. <laughs> None of them can, can, can be exposed. So she exposed us on something which we did not know. The essence. Today, everything is available in a computer you can say. My sister-in-law's small daughters, eight twins, eight or nine years, when the father starts taking, Appa, don't preach, please. I hear it, I see it. <laughs> and all of us will, will be seeing it naturally. Now, but still, stories, see our, see our uh, value system. Stories are still a good selling point to children. Forget about anything else. Children love 
stories. So, if you are able to acquaint yourself with as many stories as possible in the formative years, see, up to a point, stories should occupy their mind. Then when you go to the second stage, individual stage, you recall the stories and find out what they understand about it. Give them the chance. Don't trust this story tells only this. Give them a chance to understand. And if they come out saying that this is what, course correct them. See, five minutes in your subject in a day, two teachers in, in a spread over morning till evening, 10 to 15 minutes if you can invest on a child to connect the child with something interesting. I'm giving you story as one, one mode because bedtime stories even sell today. Now, if you start it at the 12th standard, it won't work. The problem is that. Start it at when the child is at the first. Now, let's start from the first standard student of this year. Let's do it that way. What's wrong? Because this is a 60 year old school and we only pray and wish it stays on for on on. So let's start on the first standard too. Can we now connect those children with stories? And start developing it. Value system needs to be imparted by stories and teachers to some extent living as role models. Is there into direct evidence for a child? That, that looks to be my answer. Yeah. Yes sir. Yeah, she's uh, one who, she's my friend and uh, both of them, they, they help various educational institutions with AIDS, applications and AIDS. And I requested them to come and listen to this lecture. They've been doing it extensively in the last two, three years. And uh, so many schools find it uh, extremely nice to integrate them with this apps and all. I think, I, I, have I understood you correctly? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Uh, see, I have a small uh, suggestion to that uh, teacher who asked, uh, like, oh. there will be a disconnect if uh, they are from a different generation and uh, the current students are from a different generation. Uh, why don't we look this way? Like, why don't we listen to the students what they say? Instead of we narrating some stories, why don't we listen to what the students say? The student may come up with a different story. They can come up with a Harry Potter story. The teacher can take interest and spend a few minutes of her time listening to those stories. Even my daughter, she's a Harry Potter fan. She at times tells me, Mom, Mama, in the story, Kedama, in the Harry Potter, this uh, character comes and says this. I am not able to connect it to that story at all. But still, I act like as if I'm listening to her. Yeah. I am able to get that emotional connect with her. She's, she thinks, yes, Amma believes like, uh, Amma likes this story. She talks about the voice competition, the uh, music competition that uh, is going on in American televisions. I am not able to connect to that Western music at all. But still, when she is asking me to uh, listen to that uh, YouTube uh, channel, I keep uh, listening to that. Even though I am not getting that connect, but I am able to establish a connect with my daughter. In that way, the teachers can establish a contact with the students. See, they can very well connect. I think, I think the, the concept, we'll pick the concept. The concept looks to be the child wants attention. I think that's the, that's the message you are trying to, we'll put yes. it in a conceptual frame. So, it is, we have never done it when we were students. See, the point which she's trying to drive is that. The teacher will come and teach whatever she teaches, she's, she's virtually a god to us. That's the way we have conceived a, a teacher-student relationship in our area. But today it's different. They want their point of view to be understood first before you can open up. I think that's a, that's a brilliant input which we should factor in our, in our uh, mind. So, but one thing, this giving, as she rightly said, I keep pretending to listen. You can't derive a moral out of that every time. Because what sort of a moral can a young child bring as a moral story? It, it may accidentally bounce on a moral story. But it can it will only bounce on things which attracts it. Listen to it patiently for a while and then pat it. All right. But use that connect to educate the child more. That is only a connecting point. But that connecting point will not happen if you don't attend on the child. That's the message. Second point. Good. Yeah. 
you wanted to ask him. Thank you. More of a statement than a question. Of course, uh, the connect point is very correct. Unfortunately, today's type of music, uh, if we listen to, we'll be completely destroyed. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the type of music you and I grew up on is See. completely different from what we are getting today in See. terms of uh, music. We listen to nice music which had some raga, melody, bass. Today, there's a song called Marana Mas, which is what is the most, uh, most popular song today. I have listened to this because I wanted to see what it is all about. I can guarantee you, if you, listen, if you get into the song for more than half a minute, you'll go mad. It's that bad. <laughs> anyway, that's not my point. My point is, sir, you're talking about teachers and uh, uh, the connect with the students and most of the points which you're mentioning, I'm fairly proud to say that PSBB teachers possess so many of these points, which is why PSBB is where it is today. And obviously, the inspiration for this comes from the founder, who's uh, not come here this afternoon. She's really, I mean, I've grown up with her, so I know how she is. She's, she's the one person prepared to experiment the most. She's the bravest person in the school. It's actually a risk with her. She'll come out some idea which students would be very happy if implemented. That's the type of person she is. The problem in the situation, as I see it, is the disconnect between the parent and the student and the parent and the institution. This is my observation because what, happening, what is happening is, unlike before, 40 years back or 45 years back when we grew up, parents trusted the institution, Correct. trusted their teachers. So they never questioned. They believed that the teacher is doing something good in the institution. Let's trust them. Today, one is these parents are half-baked half knowledge, <laughs> frankly speaking. So they think they know. But really they don't know. There are parent representatives here. I'm speaking on behalf of them and they themselves are students of our school, so they know that. They think they know. Secondly, there is a lot of criticism of teachers by parents at home, okay. which is seeping down to the students. And that is a wrong thing just happened. I think. I think. Uh, now, I think this, as I said, it's not a question, it's a statement. No, no, it's a sensitive. What is needed is sensitive thing, the parents See, we a lot too. See, when we want, we are in a, in a process of trying to resolve and move forward better. We should sensitize issues. See, I carefully avoided the parent segment today because I'm talking to teachers. But nice you brought the connect. Otherwise, if I volunteer, then with parents not being here, it will be a violation of natural justice talking about them behind their back. <laughs> So I should be sued for that. <laughs> so I wanted to avoid that. Don't want to speak behind their back. Let me do one. We sh I think, madam, you should arrange one session for parents then. <laughs> we should talk to them. <laughs> That's what, see, anyhow. Again, let us conceptualize. Why is this happening? If we go to the concept, then possible remedies we can think of. Why this happens? We, today, we are in an era of outsourcing. <laughs> I have outsourced my child to the institution. <laughs> the institution should deliver a product to me. <laughs> and you are all product builders. So, they don't want to take any manufacturing defects to their account. <laughs> they only say, any defect at your end is a manufacturing defect. <laughs> because whole manufacture is happening only here. Because we are not doing anything for the child. So, and you, 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 know, you put further trust. Why does this happen? Both of them go to work and they work as bosses or as employees. And it is all right fighting against right. See the mold. Let's understand how society operates. So that, see, condemnation or blame, you also did not blame nicely. That you have put it nicely, the problem. See, put the problem, we'll find a solution rather than doing a blame game. So they are under a compulsion to react like this because they are in that genetics, most of their active hours. Whole world has turned into a right society. No duty, no responsibility. Why? If the milkman doesn't come, five, if he comes five minutes late, he's fired. If the, we do it. If the driver doesn't come on time, you say, I'll have to find out an ex-driver. Now, little realizing, 
it's a he's a most specialized skill today to have a driver you can find out a good teacher but not a good driver <laughs> responsible see this is so this is what is happening i will listen to me this is my view take it you are, i i have not come here to listen to you that's the approach parents are thrusting on an institution as i walk this is exactly what i listen to responsible teachers now huh, it is difficult to educate parents even though they are educated parents we should understand that because they want results you have to i mean i am not able, i mean i am not able to come out with a ready made solution but one thing sir preaching any knowledge with a child works not with a child's parents <laughs> it's not going to work we we'll have to bring them around we we'll have to bring them around if we can take an assertive stand this is the way the child will work with me because it's in an institution don't interfere that's one technique which works with anybody because in a right based society if you assert and if they know your assertion cannot be outbeaten or questioned beyond a point then they will start to withdraw that's see it's like you if, if you go and cajole them and persuade them and pacify them they will climb more and more they will demand more and more so we we'll have to say this is the system which we want to follow if you want to add value come and add value if you want to shout at us then leave it to us it's our business whatever we produce and give you have to take it from us somewhere the institution has to take an assertive stand this child is now our custody and we are trying to do the best to the child and these are all the factors which display that we are putting the best efforts so if you don't fit into the scheme of things you should leave it to us to see how we can fit in you can't come and tell and tell, teach tell me how i should teach then you better come and teach for some time you apply leave one week in a in a month and come and join a school and do free teaching because you are able to say that i'll handle it we have to handle it with slight amount of assertion that's the best way i think you have yeah no i in fact i, I this question is not institution based and the answer is also not institution based it is about what is happening now even see if the trouble comes even from a handful of them it's 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 not good that trust the loss of trust if you start questioning the system because you are what you see to put it little more frankly what is this outsourcing what is this either what does outsourcing taught to us i pay you you should render service so by me how do you how do you do deal with emotions that way you can deal it with products you can take a product i am paying you i want this quality how do you deal with emotions how do you deal with human minds this way that is the challenge a parent should also understand yes sir with the changing times the challenge we face is the change in the value system uh even the friendship has a different uh, you know value for the set of students and for us so if you end up counseling the children we can't go their way and they will not come our way you know landing in a dichotomy of value or okay. conflicting each other so how yeah. do we handle the situation so i think i'll put it this way in fact one of sir uh, uh, yeah. i would like to add to that before oh, yeah. uh, Uh, what madam is talking i'm also an alumni and also a parent uh, completely oh. accept with uh, what mr rajendra oh, is saying and are vindicated no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no it's it is very difficult in today's times uh, because uh, the emotional connect that you are talking about children are more emotionally today connected to uh, i think uh, internet okay and digital media and their uh, as they say their social uh, uh technology that is there we are not able to relate it relate to it they relate to it better uh sometimes i even say that no why do we even need to uh, send a child to school they learn everything on the net okay and otherwise other than school uh, i am a very proud student of this school i am alumni uh so if you could throw some light on what madam is saying i really see this happening 
that the value system, see all of us like how we learned Ramayana, Mahabharata, most of us here would know it. But today's children don't know. And since most of us knew the same stories, we could imbibe the same values and the systems. But today's children don't know this, so where are they going to get their values and systems? Fortunately, please throw light on yeah, that. Yeah. Thank you. Whether it is light or darkness, you will decide. <laughs> but I can throw <laughs> that, I assure you. Because fortunately, I have spent some time doing work in this area. It's a simple question. I'll, sir, do we have some time? Yeah, you, I have time. You have, all right. Because <laughs> I've decided, see, it's, if we talk to one teacher, imagine how many people she can translate. So it's potentially hundreds of teachers here. Whatever time that is needed, I will give my... This is the only little I mean, contribution I can make in, in building a stronger society and a stronger India. Therefore, time is no constraint today to me. You tell me until hey, enough here, then I'll go. <laughs> so the answer is, this is a very simple problem and a very, very simple answer. You can't induct or induce value system either through talking or through internet. It's not going to work. Why did we practice value system? Because our parents practiced it. Simple solution to the most challenging problem in the world. So the problem is not with the child. You can't blame that child for not imbibing values. Did, did the child say, stood up uh, at three years and say, look here, I've taken a call from today. I will not imbibe any values. Has any child said? It is not exposed to any values. See, this is the trick which as, as human beings we should understand. When I say intellectual insertion and intelligentsia in a student, this is happening to us also as adults. Open your WhatsApp. What sort of a Gita lecture? You would have heard million interpretations of Bhagavad Gita. Every day. And even, see, this the joke is, something lands into you, you don't read, but you will forward to 10 people, <laughs> thinking they are going to read. Nobody reads. So, understanding philosophy, the importance of value system in the mind, no good, sir. You have to practice. So, ask a question to people who complain that there is a problem with your value system. Ask one question, are you practicing value system in your house? See, we have, most of us essentially belong to one particular religion which has every month some rituals. How many of you involve yourself in those rituals and involve your children in those rituals? Simple question I'm asking. Simple question. See, I will take this to convey the message clearly. It was a very big challenge. Some girl known to us wanted to marry a boy of a different community. And the parents were insisting, no, this is, this is not as per our tradition. So I was asked to broke as a lawyer, known friend. So, it's a small, I mean, 24, 25-year-old lay girl, independent girl. She has read here and there, acquired so many degrees behind her. So in the church, it's easy to argue a case before a court, not before this challenging, more challenging. So I asked her, they are talking about some traditions. What is your problem? She gave back only one answer. It, it, it slap, it's a slap on, a, on, on all the three faces. She said, what is this value you are talking about? I have not seen that for 25 years in my house. <laughs> what do you want? You want a boy with good qualification. He is a qualified boy. He is a boy who is earning well. Coming from a respectable lineage. And he will take care of me and I will be a life partner. This is all is required for marriage. We are now suddenly saying tradition only for me, not for my parents. So disconnect happens because of giving up of practices. You can't, and how can school substitute as full time? <laughs> then instead of one moral instruction class, we should have one physics class and 35 moral instruction class. <laughs> so
so now now let's this is the problem now come to the solution let's start today let's start see what a time lost is time lost you can't three things cannot change in the number philosophy our philosophy preaches three things are constant time once lost it's lost forever you can't go back dharmam and adharmam what was adharmam some years back will continue to be adharmam some years later it can't today from today onwards the adharmam becomes adharmam there is no supervision law may change that don't go only by the social civil laws i'm talking of the yes traditions in traditions these three won't change therefore let us start even today can you do something to connect with your child see you you can say i have my my your my your child would have been grown up you would have gone to college so disconnect wait for few more years let a child be born to your child catch him let's do it let's do it somewhere we have to do it before that you prepare yourselves for that journey you you do this for 7 8 years and wait for your child grandchild to arrive at home you would have retired or semi retired by that time spend your time and invest it on you can re see or generation poet it's all right we don't have to therefore throw away let's reinvent the wheel it's a, it's a long drawn process it requires efforts see mere understanding philosophy you you won't translate translation happens only when you practice rituals illana idana muttaalungala nam aalungala why should they do it yaar why the hell should they have implanted every 15 days do one function if it is gokulashtami then navaratri navaratri then nadanumasam danumasam shivaratri shivaratri then something else samvaratham why should they what see the plan so two three things right a this generation has skipped it so it is a to go back in time and change it's a challenge whether to invest or not it depends on your time and ability i don't have an answer there but today what you have lost start today nothing is nothing is late nothing is late you can start today so what can the institution do institution can only give concepts see it can tell a story to connect on krishna jayanti but if your house doesn't celebrate krishna jayanti how does the story have a bearing on the child a teacher tells the story during krishna jayanti and a krishna jayanti program is performed in your house it will connect so it requires parents help their institution cannot do you can't outsource value system to an institution it is essentially a home job and a teacher can impact don't make a teacher a value system teacher she has to teach other subjects also so we can't burden the teacher or the institution this is my answer yeah anything else oh yeah i'm a proud parent of psbb my son is in grade 3 and he has been blessed with uh, wonderful teachers thank you venkatram uncle for uh, as i fondly call you for a wonderful lecture um i have got a question for, not a question for you a tip from you i need um it is easy to say control your anger when your kid troubles you or something like that so what would you do if you were in my place yeah good any good tip to control the anger no, at that all, point of time yeah, yeah i'm going to answer it in front of my family so <laughs> <laughs> i will answer it thank See, you it's uh, we have done some work uh, also in this area so i will be able to share it <laughs> where do you get and when do you get anger where you are able to take liberties with people liberty see wherever you can extend liberty you can also extend anger that's one area wherever somebody is weak and you are invincible then you will inflict anger there because it once anger retards then you will me- mellow down that's natural human psychology thirupi adicha avladan adikira varaikum adikalam 
Anger works only to that extent. So, these are two major situations. Either when somebody is weak, you keep crushing. Or uh, when somebody with whom you can take liberty, you can take, uh, take that extra advantage and shout. It happens only in these two. Now, in the case of liberty, if you want to exclude anger, then you must also exclude liberty. I am talking because this is in a very, very personal sense with family and such, such relationship. It is very difficult to run a minute-to-minute -minute, uh, involvement with your spouse or with your child that you should not be anger. I should not uh, show anger. You will show anger. And uh, you must fight and then resolve it. And in whatever way it takes the shape to resolve, you should find a mechanism to resolve. It is not that easy because otherwise you have to give up liberty with your own husband. If you say that I will treat you as a friend, you won't be angry. Can you take your friend for task every time you want? You can't. Whereas you can take your husband and your husband can take. I, I mean it both ways. Again, don't, it's not one-sided. I mean it both ways. He can take it because he can't, can he take it with his women colleague in the office? He won't. <laughs> she will go and complain. So it goes with, essentially it goes with liberty. That's one area. It's, it's, a, it's a different ball game. But in the other area where you can crush, I think that is dangerous. That is, that is exactly what, especially in a teacher in a school, it can happen. Very easily it can happen. Now, how to get over anger? It, see, there are only two things. First, let us understand the concept and see how we can practice it. The anger is classified into several categories. One, outburst. By nature, somebody outbursts, that's one. Second category, there are people, when they shout, they realize that they're actually shouting. Three, there are people, after shouting, they settle down and think that they have shouted. Four, reckless guys, they keep shouting whenever the occasion arises. <laughs> so, if your mind thinks about the, that you are angry, that's the first step you have taken in conquering anger. Mind has to first accept a mistake, otherwise mind won't change. And acceptance is the starting point for mind to do any change. If it's not accepting a point, it won't change. Now, if you start accepting that, there are only two ways to conquer anger. You have to develop tolerance and you have to develop patience. These are the two tools which can hit at anger. These two tools, it's, if it is not in your DNA, <laughs> then it's a challenge. Because DNA can change, it's a, it's a different science. But normally, normally, values, traditions, family, if you, are, if you are lived a collective emotional life, it's, it depends on the circumstances in which your anger has uh, shaped, shaped. If you are with a group of people, if you have been, then even if you are anger, you will be tolerated. And if somebody is angry, you will, be, you will tolerate it. So anger or rent to tools is only patience and tolerance. My, my recommendation, because my recommendation, this transformation, only a spiritual guru can do it to you, <laughs> if you believe in that. Because this is a genetic transformation. Otherwise, you should mentally work rigorously to become patient. It's a lifetime. Where is the time for you to think of your mind to know that you should be tolerant? This is the challenge on anger. At least I have clinically understood what your problem is. One sect is very difficult to solve when it comes to liberties. In the other sect, wherever you can, you can crush you think twice whether you should do it. It is anger is a dangerous disease. It first kills you before it hurts somebody else. And the second degree is jealousy. And the third degree is hatred. All the three first kills the person from whom it stems before it chooses to hit somebody else. They should be given up. There's no compromise. Yes. We'll take two more and then yeah. one plus one and then. 
సార్ గుడ్ ఈవినింగ్ ఐఎమ్ కండన్ హిందీ టీచర్ ఇన్ ద స్కూల్ ఐ హ్యావ్ వాంట్ టు యాడ్ వన్ మోర్ పాయింట్ ఇన్ దిస్ అబౌట్ యాంగర్ ఐ యాక్సెప్ట్ వాట్ ఎవర్ యూ సే బట్ వన్ పాయింట్ ఐ థింక్ ఇట్ ఈస్ టు బి మెన్షన్డ్ ఇన్ దిస్ ఈస్ యాంగర్ ఇస్ నథింగ్ బట్ ఇనేబిలిటీ వెన్ వీ నో దాట్ వీ కాంట్ డూ ఎనీథింగ్ ఆఫ్ట్ సర్టన్ పాయింట్ దట్ ఈస్ ద పాయింట్ వేర్ ద యాంగర్ కమ్స్ అవుట్ వన్స్ వీ నో అబౌట్ ఇట్ దట్ వీ ఆర్ అనేబుల్ వీ కెన్ నాట్ డూ ఎనీథింగ్ then anger comes let us enable ourselves yeah. then anger will go out automatically once you know that i am incapable of that let me capable my let me resource myself so that the anger will never come that is what i practice Good. 10 years before it was different nowadays i am very clear about that when you know that you cannot do anything over that keep quiet just like as you told patient and tolerance definitely helps me but inability is the main driving force where the anger gets birth thank you sir no sukanya's question is this also i understand but tell me how to develop patience or develop tolerance that's the, that's the that's the basic question which uh, uh, she is raising see yes sir uh, see ba- uh, no, please sir please sir yeah. see i mean geeta also explains beautifully see anger or a root is desire unfulfilled desire stems into anger it may be a silly desire it will be a great desire on why you want to thrust your desire on somebody somebody doesn't want to take that because it is not their desire simple i have one desire my child doesn't have agree with that desire will he or she not revolt they will revolt and when they revolt you feel my child is revolt then this is how so this is what geeta says so anger basic point is unfulfilled desires transfer into anger is the conceptualize but we can we can keep conceptualizing it but the practical solution lies unless you are trained in ritualistic practices see that's the that's the hardcore reality why should they otherwise keep all this in our systems if you do all this you will not find the time to show anger <laughs> that, that's the, that's the secret you should not find the opportunity or the time mental makeup comes last avoid first avoid only then you should know to shoot you can't say i will brave it and then win anger technically we can put lecture discourse doesn't work yeah last question please any other question then we'll be the with our wait up it's not coming from the teachers again from their point of view in today's society forget uh, a school alone general society itself both tolerance and patience are seen as a sign of weakness because Espe- we have become a right based society especially so in a classroom probably i do not know how it is in psbb but where i studied which is many years back it was an all boys school especially so there if you show if a teacher showed patience and tolerance students took it as a sign of weakness and actually retaliated and made the teacher suffer a lot for that as a group so in a such a situation for a school point of view sometimes is it okay to right. get angry no, no, without should, uh, no it's see it's, you, i think you should not that even, was my question no this is a sign of weakness you should not even seek a permission see the the, the beauty of a teacher is an angry teacher is also a loud teacher you should believe because what follows after that angry moments matters the most for a child that's the ma- with a child it is easy that way because child is always like a clay you can keep shaping it now and then the way you find out something is wrong that she the child cannot be brought to sense of reasoning it will it will still stick on to say that the child the teacher has hurt but there are million ways of cajoling the child after that don't compromise on not showing your uh, unacceptance to the child's behavior anga compromise panna kudadu that's bad that then that weakens your system and the child gets a wrong idea you be firm there but still you can be kind to the child it will slowly understand that we are committing some mistake somewhere otherwise why should a teacher who is otherwise kind shout at me otherwise you are kind if kindness is your basic nature 
Anger is acceptable. When kindness is not there and you are considered to be portraying anger very few times or many times, then it puts the child into a serious mental jeopardy. That's the point. So basically be kind. Angry moments will there because you don't come to school every day to show anger here. The students should understand, parents should also understand. So it was yeah, yeah. Poor teachers have only 30% influence on the students. 10% by the parents. Remaining 50% society and friends only. How are they going to really manage them? See, uh, either arithmetically 60, 30, 10, I understand the number, but I have one strong faith. If the child gets the right signals with the teacher, and if, if the child, the teacher is a good guide to the child, then the sense of preparedness of such a child facing the society is much stronger. Here, this is not a distinction. With 10% efficiency, you can handle even 90% shock. It's like a, a drug. Potent, the potent drug will be only 1%. 99% will be filler. It is introduced, but it still cures the disorder. A strong child, a good groomed child, even if it is only 10% uh, or 15%, whatever proportion, it can stand up and face 85% of the society. It's possible. See. So we, we can't go and teach the society to change because nature moves in a particular direction. That's why I said, don't swim. If your education system is framed this way, you can't say, I'll use my intelligence to have a different education system. You'll fail. You'll disconnect. So don't do anything which otherwise is not happening in the society. You can't, you have to integrate with the society and live. But you can always reserve your personal zones to yourself which is dharma, adharma, and your time. There is no compromise there. There, society cannot influence you. However much society may be corrupt, there are still good people. How do you say? The whole society has gone bad, majority has gone bad. But not all. So you can constitute that singular minority if you want. Never mind. So that should be the answer I feel we should... Uh, it was a... Wonderful. Thank you once again. <laughs> <clears throat> Looking forward to December 2019. Thank you so much. <laughs>